Good afternoon, everyone. I am attorney Don Dennis, and I'd like to welcome you to recognizing and eliminating bias in artificial intelligence. Hey Siri, hey Bixby, hey Alexa, how exactly do you work? Well, that's what we're going to discuss today, how they work and some of the possible problems that come about and that have come about due to some of the bias that is inside of the software. Again, this seminar is intended to provide a general overview of the law. Advice should be sought about your specific circumstances. No attorney-client relationship is formed until there is a signed agreement with either of our offices. Diana, could you please introduce yourself? Absolutely, thanks Don. I'm happy to be here with you today. I'm Diana Ikatani Iorlano, and I'm the owner and founder of Ikatani Law, which is in El Segundo, California. And um, I am a privacy lawyer, as well as a litigator and outside general counsel. Um, I am certified by the International Association of Privacy Professionals for US, European, and Privacy Program Management. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to jump into today was really just talking about you know, what biases do all of us bring to the table? For instance, when you saw, when you were signing up for this MCLE on AI, artificial intelligence, you know, were, were Don and I the type of lawyers that you would picture being technology lawyers or privacy lawyers? Or when you envision the word litigator, who do you think of? Um, so I think that we're going to explore some of those options and those ideas today. But Don, let's, let's hear a little bit about you. So yes, my name is Don Dennis. I have the law office of Don Dennis, where I specialize in intellectual property technology and data privacy law. I used to be an engineer for about 10 years and decided to go back to school and become an attorney. And voila, here I am. Like Diana, I am also a certified information privacy professional with US law. And we're looking forward to sharing some of our experiences along with informing you of some recent developments in the arena of artificial intelligence. So let's get right into what we are defining as artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is using computers or other devices to replicate the thinking function of a human by perceiving the environment and trying to achieve a goal. So I started off the presentation by saying, hey Siri, hey Alexa, hey Bixby. And the reason I did that is because that is an example of artificial intelligence that many people use on a very frequent basis to get directions, to get maps, to get information about what time a store will close or open, or if it's still open in fact. So that's an example of artificial intelligence that we're all familiar with. The way the process works is that data is gathered and then data is prepared in suitable formats to be used for a computer algorithm. And then features are extracted from the data, a model is created, the model is tested, and then they put it out there and it's supposed to make predictions. And those predictions and responses and answers that we all want are refined over time. However, I have to tell you that in every part of that process, a human touches the data. A human is involved in the modeling of that. And in particular, since we're talking about biases and we're talking about data, 
we have to add a word in front of data, meaning social data, data that pertains to people and their attributes, their preferences, their actions and their interactions. And for a few examples, we're gonna get into how data also can be based on individuals' phenotypes, their physical attributes. So we have to keep that in mind. So now let's get into what exactly we're going to define as bias. Today, we're going to say that bias is prejudice in favor or against one thing, person, or group compared with another thing, person, or group, usually in a way considered to be unfair. So, Diana, can you talk to us a little bit about how you recognize bias? Or what does it look like? I think that... The yeah, I think it looks different to different people. I think that those who've experienced bias, um, whether overtly or inadvertently, um, do have the ability to recognize it. And I hate to say it's one of those, you know it when you see it types of things, but sometimes it is that. Um, sometimes it can be through comments. It can be um, something that someone says that shows that they have some sort of bias to a specific group. Um, uh, I'm a Dodger fan, so some people might have bias towards Dodger fans, um, not, maybe not after last night, we'll see. Um, but I think that it can be comments like, uh, for me, I, I, I had often experienced saying, young lady, what do you think about that? Uh, and that can be bias in, in sort of trying to put me into a place as being a younger person, whereas I've actually been practicing law for 23 years, so somebody might not know that. Um, I think that a lot of especially minority attorneys sometimes get the phrase, you know, you don't look young, you don't look old enough to be a lawyer. Um, and, and I think it can be things just ab absolutely comments that you hear, um, but, but it can be actions. It can be um, unfair treatment. Um, you know, if you are uh, followed around in a store or if you experience something where someone uh, maybe doesn't talk to you in an elevator or something like that, um, but it can also be inaction. It can be the fact that you're left out from uh, the, the weekly lunch at work where everyone is going, but you, you haven't been invited. Um, is there some sort of bias there or is something else going on? And when we talk about omissions, it's, it's that failure to act um, when you see uh, a biased action occurring in front of you, right? So if you happen to see somebody speaking in a way um, that may not affect uh, an immediate audience. They're talking about a group of people or a gender or um, a political organization. Um, you may hear those types of things and fail to say something, fail to call it out, fail to, to identify the biased behavior in others. And I think that those omissions too are equally important when we're talking about bias. So Don, what are your other thoughts on that? Uh, I think you hit it right on the head. In addition, there are comments that may seem very harmless that individuals can make, but in fact, it can be perceived in a much different way, such as if you, if a person saw a black person and they may say, hey, so you are a member of the Black Lives Matter movement, or you were at that meeting past weekend, this past weekend, or something like that. You know, that's an assumption, make, making it, and also you're saying that, hey, this person, because of their race or ethnicity, they automatically attended this event where they espouse that belief. In terms of actions, as you were talking about, excluding individuals for no other reason, especially if we're talking about the practice of law in which the, no the number of non-Caucasian individuals is relatively small in comparison to other group uh, Caucasians. So if person, that individual or individuals is excluded from an event, it does have bad appearances sometimes. So we have to be cognizant of that. And then also, like Diana said, omissions. You know, you hear something or you hear other people saying something that you know is prejudicial or improper. Are you, do you have the courage and fortitude to stand up and say, hey, that's improper? Because by silence, it seems that you accept it and you're going along with it. And so sometimes it's a hard tugging at the heartstrings to make that decision in the moment as to how to proceed. Right. So, Diana, what are some of the effects of bias? I mean, have you been ever been on the receiving end of bias treatment? And what are some of the effects? Because some, not everyone, you know, we don't want to assume that everyone has experienced the same type of prejudicial or racial bias. So if you have, 
you know, can you talk about some of the effects of it? Absolutely. And, and I don't mean to imply that everyone feels the same way um, when they are on the receiving end of bias treatment. Obviously, you know, we're, many of us on the phone uh, on the webinar today are lawyers and we're relatively thick skinned. So, um, you know, it may be that you, the first time something happens, you let it go. The second time it happens, you say, hey, is, is that me or is it the other person? So I think that the, if, when you're on the receiving end, some of the unintended uh, consequences can be um, for new lawyers or even transitioning lawyers getting into a new practice of law uh, or new area of law. I think for young lawyers, it can often it manifest itself as a feeling of inadequacy, saying like, is this the right profession for me? You know, questioning yourself, did I get the right education? Do I know this? And, and we all know that many of the skills that you need to be a lawyer are developed after law school. So it, it might not be something that's easily trained, you know, just by the books. So I think that the, when you're on the receiving end, sometimes it can make you question whether or not you can take on something outside of your comfort zone. And I think it can also be confusing because if you're on the receiving end of some sort of biased treatment, let's say, for instance, from a judge, uh, you're, you're arguing something at oral argument and the judge starts to question whether or not you read the case or whether or not you did your homework. Um, you know, is it really about the merits of the case? Is it some bias about uh, the, the type of lawyer, the age of the lawyer, the gender of the lawyer? And, and again, bias can be for all different types of things, whether age or gender or sexual orientation or gender, gender appearance, um, race, religion. Um, you know, if those things are uh, even if the things are not readily visibly available, um, there can be some bias that you're seeing with those things. So, Diana, can you talk to what are the consequences of bias in the legal recruiting arena? Yeah, I, I was the chief recruiting officer for a large law firm in town for several years. And I think that what I've learned, um, I actually just read a recent Harvard Business Review article that was talking about um, using AI actually to eliminate bias from hiring because the, the process is inherently flawed, as you know, um, because some of the deepest rooted sources of bias in artificial intelligence are actually because it's based on human behavior. We're trying to simulate human behavior. So when you look at traditional recruiting, you know, you're looking at who's screening those resumes, who's looking at your base to see who you want to bring in into your company. Uh, and with the advent of technology, we've now created this world where, um, you know, LinkedIn, Indeed.com, you know, Monster.com, Zip Recruiting, now we generate so many different resumes. I think on average, uh, in their Harvard Business Review article, they said for a single position, you're going to get an average of 250 applications. And then think about the scale of that. If it's a, now a remote, remote position that you're recruiting for, you might get hundreds or thousands of applications. So how do you sort through that? You know, now you, you really need to use AI to kind of figure out who do I want to call for an interview? What resumes do I want to look at more, uh, more closely, you know, and traditionally we'd use humans to do that. So it might be a recruiting assistant, a recruiting manager looking at those and, and, or as the hiring committee, you might say, Hey, you know what? We've got 250 people. We need to narrow it down to 20. So why don't you just pull everybody who's in the top 10% of their class in law school for a law firm or everybody who went to an Ivy league? not realizing that that actually may inherently be biased because of the, the opportunities um, afforded to people who are in the top 10 of, of percent of the class or who did go to Ivy League schools. So when we're looking at that, um, if you are using AI in recruiting, how are you, how are you programming that? Um, or if you are just still using manual <laughs> human labor for that, are you giving directives that might actually be infusing bias into the process by by eliminating a potential pool of people when I was in recruiting and I think Don I may have told you the story um, you know one of the things that I like to see uh, on on a resume sometimes for a law student uh, early on you know I, I my brothers were in Boy Scouts and and I had an applicant who came in and had an Eagle Scout designation and I thought that's that's a great great thing to have Eagle Scouts takes a lot of time and effort to do 
But then when you start to look at it, you say, there's a certain level of opportunity that somebody must have in order to be an Eagle Scout. And frankly, there isn't a readily available equivalent for female applicants. I, I know now, my son is a Cub Scout. I know now that the Boy Scouts of America are now scouting of America. So it's open to boys and girls. But we're looking at Eagle Scout, which is traditionally a male position. And it will take many, many years for women to achieve an Eagle Scout uh, designation, even with the Boy Scouts opening up that opportunity. So if you're looking at things like that, you have to look and say, is there a bias there about uh, this thing that I'm using as a homework that might be limiting the, the, the pool of applicants that I'm pulling from? So, you know, the other example I gave you, Dawn, was, you know, I think that we often overlook the work experience for, especially for lawyers. So if you have a student, two students equally situated, one who has previously worked at a law firm and one who is a manager of a fast food chain, a fast food franchise or a restaurant for a few years, um, it may well be that that manager has much better conflict resolution uh, uh, skills than somebody who may have been doing just sort of filing at a law firm while they were in college. So I think that there is bias sort of built into what we think is the ideal background. And in this instance, I'm talking about law firms, but it can be applied in all types of business. You know, what are the, those, those qualities you're looking for as opposed to those opportunities that you're calling from? So if you're looking for skills, then identify those skills and let's find an unbiased way to to really draw applicants in from those skill sets as opposed to some of these more arbitrator, uh, arbitrary arbitrary uh, equivalents. And I thank the in the comments, I thank you that the gold award is equivalent to the Eagle Scout. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I think that in my experience, I didn't see that as often coming up. Um, but I think that that's also something that you know I should know. So the fact that I'm learning something today is really important. Uh, and I think that that's uh, uh, very, very telling. So, yeah. And also on this slide, as you can see, I bring up absence of proof. The reason that I bring this up is because oftentimes individuals that assert they have been on the receiving end of biased treatment or prejudicial treatment it's very hard for them to have the proof sometimes to prove that, to show actually what has happened. In fact, the Federal Trade Commissioner Rohit Chopra stated that it is rare to uncover direct evidence of racist intent and therefore disparate impact analysis is necessary to uncover hidden forms of discrimination. Now what we see oftentimes in the news is we have videos and there's been a movement that everyone has seen all across the country based on things that have happened where they believe it appears to be mistreatment, abuse, or what have you. But despite that, you have to think for a moment, does that mean that previous claims that people made where they said they were being abused or mistreated didn't occur because they didn't have video evidence or proof? Because that, you know, there's a lot of things that are different now in society because almost everyone has a phone. Another question that we have to force ourselves to answer, if we are feeling distrusting of certain things and accounts that we repeatedly hear, is it, is, are you saying that did it, the problem, the situation probably didn't happen because I don't know anyone that it personally happened to or it's never happened to me, so maybe it's not as big an issue as we think? Or should the proof be solely based on some type of published data? Now, when we think about data, and let's just talk about from a criminal aspect, from a criminal justice standpoint, data is a, based on the, record, the rap sheet, records of arrest and prosecutions. However, we learned many years ago, and many of us employed on a daily basis, if you're criminal lawyers, about prosecutorial discretion, meaning that at the street level, police and law enforcement decide who they'll give a ticket to and who they'll give a warning to. And district attorneys also decide what charges they're going to file and what charges they're not going to file. So with that in mind, we have to remember that data in that aspect can be biased if there's not enough of it or if it's unevenly distributed or taken into account. Now, let's, let's see here. 
let's talk about algorithmic discrimination. How can this occur? So algorithmic discrimination can occur when the IAI is created with bias. Ruth Catlow said that if AI and algorithm, algorithms reinforce the prejudices and biases of human creators, how do we fight discrimination and injustice? Because as attorneys, we all are seeking the truth of the matter and what we're working on. Algorithms are not neutral and unbiased, but oftentimes reflect, reinforce, and automate historical biases and inequalities of society, such as racial, social, or gender prejudices. So there's an example, and it was in the handouts. Uh, Microsoft came out with a program kind of similar to Siri years ago called Tay. And Tay was designed to be an automatic reply chatbot in which you could pose questions or bring up discussion topics and it would reply. Well, Tay got out of control. And in the course of 16 hours, Tay put out 96,000 tweets. And the problem is that although Tay had data in it, trying to learn how to intuitively respond to people is a big issue for AI. And it's called a natural language processing issue. So Tay ended up putting out a lot of prejudicial comments, a lot of anti-Semitic comments during that time, and Microsoft had to get rid of it. However, you want to understand how this got started. And the, re the way it got created was the combination of data plus written material produced by professional comedians. So who was supervising the comedians? What were the comedians' thoughts and what, what, what data was fed into the system? Another example is a case current that was recently filed on June the 16th, 2020 in the Northern District of California. It's entitled Newman versus Google and YouTube. And basically there are four black women that are suing YouTube for their allegations of overt, intentional and systematic racial discrimination. And they're alleging that YouTube blocks them and their channels or videos based on racial identity or viewpoint discrimination. And in paragraph 10 of the complaint, they're talking about how the AI, the algorithms, the computer filtering and review tools are used to target plaintiffs to restrict access. The plaintiffs claim that their videos that were blocked because YouTube said, hey, they violate uh, their, their content rules and therefore they restrict and censor people that do so. However, the plaintiffs are claiming that other viewpoints that are similar to theirs are not blocked. And in addition, they're alleging that on March the 19th, 2017, YouTube admitted to improperly censoring videos using the restricted mode filtering of the LGBTQ plus community. On September the 14th, 2017, YouTube admitted that their content filtering review tools were targeting blacks and others, and the which resulted in the application of erroneous or unwarranted blocking restrictions and access denials for users based on their racial or sexual identity or viewpoints. And YouTube said that they were working on a fix. How does this impact individuals? Well, it impacts individuals because many people derive revenue based on the number of subscribers and how large their channels are and the number of views that they get. And so if you're being limited, if you're subject to a shadow ban or if certain videos are blocked or removed, it directly impacts your business. Also, what the four ladies ended up doing is self-censoring themselves because they found that if they made any reference, if, and they, I'm sorry, they self-censored themselves by making sure not to make any reference to anything related to Black Lives Matter, the KKK, uh, racism, white supremacy, or anything in that vein in order to not be shadow banned or blocked from time to time. Now, when we're talking about algorithmic discrimination, there are various societal harms that result from it. And attached in the handouts was a study and a research report, and it also can be found at gendershades.org. And they talk about some of the individual harms that result from algorithmic discrimination, such as hiring decisions, 
employment decisions, insurance decisions, and the types of rates you'll be quoted, housing decisions, and decisions concerning educational opportunities. In addition, credit can be infect, affected. The differential prices of goods that you're afforded is affected. Loss of liberty in terms of maybe being subject to more frequent targeting by the police. And then there are also societal collective harms, such as opportunities, economic loss, and social stigma, stigmatization. Because being subject to certain discrimination does have an impact. Yes, we look at the data, but there's a human side to all of this. So there is an impact to that as well. So Diana, can you talk, so we've identified some of the ways that bias can find its way into AI. And we have some more specific examples we're gonna give shortly. But what are some of the benefits of eliminating bias? I mean, yes, everyone now understands and has a general idea of how it works, but why should they be motivated or would they be motivated to do something about it? It's a great question, Don. I, I think one, one thing really quickly before I jump into that, I did want to note that there have been some questions in the Q&A and I've been trying to answer those in written form. We may not have time because we have a lot of content. We may not have time to get to all those questions live, but um, feel free to post your questions there if you have them. Uh, if we're not able to, to answer them during the, this, we may be able to respond to you offline. Um, but in, in looking at why it's important or, or profitable to eliminate bias, I, I think what we're finding is that companies that are diverse, uh, whether it's in age, it's in uh, race, it's in gender, uh, they tend to be more profitable simply because they are appealing to a larger swath of their customer base. Um, and I think also you're finding now that a lot of corporations have initiatives where it says that they will uh, award work to uh, companies that have a diverse background or have a different you know, demographics. And I think you've seen in California too, where they're now, whether you agree with it or not, um, where they're now requiring that you have a, a woman or a person of color on, on certain corporate boards. Um, you know, it, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but I think, you know, the, the hidden impact is that businesses, customers tend to work with businesses that reflect them. Right. So as we see growing numbers of diverse individuals that are purchasing your products, whether they be legal services, whether it be retail, whether it be dining establishments, um, there is a lot of customer loyalty that's tied into whether you're involved in the community. Um, there's a, a lot of social capital that comes from that. So um, and increased employee happiness too. Um, you know, I, I have actually been the only woman in a firm before or the only uh, person of color in a firm before. And it's, uh, it's a difficult position to be in. So I think that if you're, if you're, if you've eliminated that bias and that experience for people um, of being an outsider, you, you've really tried to take strides to eliminate bias internally, uh, I think you'll find increased employee happiness as well. Excellent. So let's talk about discriminatory pricing and how bias can play a role in that. In the matter of the Federal Trade Commission versus Liberty Chevrolet, for the first time, the FTC charged an auto dealer with illegal racial discrimination. This dealer based out of the Bronx, Bronx Honda, and its general manager, Carlo Fittato, has to pay 1.5 million to settle FTC charges they discriminated against African-American and Hispanic car buyers and engaged in other illegal practices. According to the complaint, the defendant told salespeople to charge higher financing, markups, and fees to African-Americans and Hispanic customers. The defendants told employees that these groups should be targeted due to their limited education and not to attempt the same practices with non-Hispanic white consumers. So the FTC charged that their acts or practices were unfair under Section 5 of the FTC Act because they're likely to cause substantial injury to consumers that consumers cannot reasonably avoid themselves and that are not uh, outweighed by the countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. Here are some of the examples of what they were doing. So in general, a car can be certified pre-owned by Honda, which means that it has, be has been reconditioned 
and given a 100,000 mile warranty. And that's just a standard thing that they do. But despite the fact that they advertise the cars as being pre-owned and certified, they tacked on a fee to the buyers for up to $1,995 for this certification tag, despite the fact they already advertised the car as having that certification. In addition, the dealer charged fees for prepping the car, shopping it, and reconditioning it almost as much as $14,495 for the vehicle. And as you know, for things that they already said it came with. In addition, they inflated the documentation fees. In New York, the law limited those fees to $75. Sometimes they charge people up to $695. They added additional sales and tax fees. Sometimes they doubled the sales and tax fees without the customer knowledge. And then lastly, they were inflating the car's price against the specific people that they were targeting. So this is an example of how discriminatory pricing targeted individuals and the effects that it has on people in a real way. In addition, the other case or um, document that you'll see in your reading materials is the Housing Urban Development Department versus Facebook. As we know, Facebook collects a lot of data and they use machine learning and other prediction techniques to classify and group users so as to project each user's likes and their likely response to a given ad. So in doing so, Facebook recreates groupings defined by protected classes. So for example, based on the likes that you have, that's where they're gonna group you into it. So what happened is Facebook was charged with discriminating by making dwellings unavailable because of race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin, or disability. Now, despite the algorithms that Facebook uses, if you're an advertiser and you wanted to target a specific audience in this situation concerning real estate, then if it broadly spanned protected classes, Facebook's ad delivery system would not show the ad to the diverse audience that the system considers users with particular characteristics that wouldn't fit that mold. And they structured, this, they structured this system in that way. So regardless of you wanting to target certain people, there was no way the ad could get to those people. They did it based on common qualities with people they thought would be most appealed to based on the ad. And they charged different prices. So what Facebook considered was the sex, meaning men versus women and other close proximities, proxy, I'm sorry, other close proxies in how the ad would be delivered. So like I said, even if you said, hey, specifically, I want to deliver to everyone in this area, regardless of their sex, regardless of any other like factors or proxies or preferences in the system, it wasn't going to happen. So HUD said that it was unlawful to make, print, or publish, or cause to be made, printed, or published any notice, statement, or advertisement with respect to the sale or rental of a dwelling that indicates any preference, limitation, or discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin, or disability, or that indicates an intention to make such a distinction. And in doing so, when you're trying to take out ads, Facebook was found to have charged different advertisements, Isers, different prices to show the ad to the same users. So there may be one price to show this set of rental ads or real estate for sale to women and another price to show this same advertisement to men. Another way that bias in AI has found its way is in impacting credit. David Heinmeier Hansen wrote a series of tweets complaining that he got a credit limit of 20 times higher than his wife, despite the fact that the couple files taxes, tax returns jointly. Well, at the time, he was referring to an Apple card that was branded and marketed by Apple and users signed up for the card and applied for credit inside the wallet app on the iPhone. But the credit component of the product is handled by Goldman, which is 
getting it, making its way into consumer banking. And so therefore, you know, there was this complaint that, hey, why is there a difference in the credit that's being provided to me as a man and my wife as a woman? So where are possible ways that we're headed with respect to AI? There is an Israeli company called Faceception. And if you go to their website, it says on their website, what if it was possible to know whether an anonymous individual is a potential terrorist, an aggressive person, or a potential criminal? Better yet, what if that information could be obtained and used in real time when it matters the most? Faithception states that it provides actionable intelligence as predicted traits and behaviors of individuals. Faithception says that we reveal personality from facial images at scale to revolutionize how companies, organizations, and even robots understand people and dramatically improve public safety, communications, decision-making, and experiences. So when you hear that, what does that say to you, Diana? What, what goes through your mind when you hear that? It is absolutely terrifying to me. And I, and I went on the Faceception website just to check it out myself. Um, it is really interesting what they're promising. I mean, they're, they're basically promising, hey, we can find terrorists with this facial recognition software. So uh, for me, uh, as a person of color, um, you know, I, I really want to know what the algorithm is that's being used. I really want to know, you know, where are they taking this information from? Because, you know, frankly, if you're looking at what exists out there already, and, and frankly, none of us know what actually exists because there's a lot of law enforcement facial recognition software that's being used that doesn't have to be publicly vetted. So I think, you know, when you're looking at what is the basis, and I don't know that the average business user who decides to hire Faceception for their new uh, facial recognition software at their brand new retail store or their plaza, I don't know that they would have access to that underlying data. Um, it's, it's a scary thought. I mean, I, I know that we're all familiar with the facial recognition software that's used on, on the Face ID for your iPhone, uh, or when you're on Facebook and it tells you, hey, I want to tag these 50 people as your contact on Dennis. Um, yeah, I know we're all, we're all used to that, but I think there's a sliding scale there <laughs> where it starts to get into, okay, how did they think, and, and, we, and obviously we see those flaws too. Um, I look a lot like my sister, so it'll try to tag my sister as me in a lot of photos. And so if we're really just looking at uh, uh, you know, the uses of facial recognition, that might be fine on Facebook, but if my sister's a terrorist and, and I'm now being tagged as her, that becomes much more problematic. Um, and I think you know, there is that human element. Where does that human element come in to determine you know, whether, whether the baseline, what we're using as the criteria are inherently biased or not. So I don't know what the answer is because I think we're going to continue to see a lot more of this, Don, don't you? Yeah, and actually there's a, a case, the state of Vermont versus Clearview AI for artificial intelligence, and it came out in Vermont, the, in the state of Vermont. Um, and on September the 4th, 2020, just last month, the court ruled denying Clearview's motion to dismiss the state's consumer fraud action that was filed against it. So you, Clearview says, Clearview AI, they say using Clearview's AI system, law enforcement is able to catch the most dangerous criminals, solve the toughest cold cases, and make communities safer, especially the most vulnerable amongst us. Their AI is based on identifying people using facial recognition technology applied to photographs. They use screen scraping technology and extracted biometric identifiers and have three billion photos in their database. The types of biometric information that they look at include the face position, the shape, the eye shape, the nose, the cheekbone, and the jaw. Clearview had claimed that they were 98.6 to 99.6% accurate for their photograph matching technology without providing any evidence 
on what standard they used to come up that benchmark. In addition, Clearview claimed an accuracy rate of 100% according to the ACLU's methodology, but they later retracted it after the ACLU complained that Clearview had not properly applied the technology. Also, Clearview did not provide its matching algorithm for testing to the only entity that provides public testing of facial recognition technology. So maybe the slide might be uh, improperly worded because I write, where are we headed? And with Clearview AI, it says we're already here based on some of the claims that they're making as to what they have available and what can be done. Um, let's move forward. So what are some steps that software developers can take to eliminate bias in AI? You know, as I said at the beginning, rather than just classifying things as data, let's consider adding social data sets because data alone has no moral framework. Whatever maxim, as we know, whatever maximize engage, maximizes engagement gets the attention of the computer with a goal, a goal of increasing followers. And it's a repeat pattern based on prediction as to what it deems as successful. So when the software developers are creating the system or when clients are looking for different software to use, you wanna make sure that they are using models that fit into the world consistent with your cultural politics, values, and institutional values and legitimate research. Is there any transparency and accountability a part of it? As I just said in this case with, a, with a Clearview AI, their, their, their technology has not been tested. It has not met a benchmark that they say it has. So how exactly do you know it's going to be correct? In addition, are the phenotypic and demographic information being used, is it in fact accurate? The latest gender classification report for the, from the National Institute for Standards and Technology shows that algorithms in NIST evaluated performed worse for female labeled faces than male labeled faces. In addition, Georgetown Law School, Law Center's Privacy and Technology Center did a report called the Perpetual Lineup. And they actually have a website, the Perpetual Lineup. And they looked into law enforcement and facial recognition technology and found that it is largely unregulated. They found that historically, the FBI fingerprint and DNA databases have been primarily or exclusively made up of information from criminal arrest and investigation. By running face recognition searches against 16 driver's license photo databases, the FBI has built a biometric network that primarily includes law-abiding citizens. And to quote them exactly, law-abiding Americans. When Georgetown did this study, they reached out to numerous law enforcement agencies all throughout the country, including the Los Angeles Police Department. And the Los Angeles Police Department, according to their study, has repeatedly announced new face recognition initiatives, including a smart car equipped with face recognition and real-time face recognition cameras. Yet the agency claims to have no records responsive to their document requests of how all of the technology works, the transparency regarding the technology, and what accountability features and functionality is a part of the technology. Um, so what can attorneys do to eliminate bias and protect their clients? First of all, it's highly advisable to really think before you act, before you fail to act, or before you comment. So try not to form opinions until you form relationships with people. Two, there is an issue in saying that there is no issue because you don't experience it. It minimizes the information and the feelings of others. And only now, as I was saying very early in the presentation, has that been dealt with and addressed on a frequent way because of the video recordings that everyone has you see on TV and on the news and audio recordings that were not available in the past. Lastly, think carefully about taming your tongue and your thumbs 
because once you put something out there, it's very hard to retrieve it or retract it where it's done and people believe it was done in a meaningful, genuine way. Diana, did you have any tips also you'd like to add? Well, I think there were some comments in the Q&A that, that sort of raised this too. I think, you know, we were talking about whether it makes more sense as opposed to eliminating bias to really managing bias. And, and, I, and I say to tongue in cheek, um, the MCLE requirement is elimination of bias. And that's why we talk about eliminating bias. Um, but I, I think it's a, it's a very valid question because I think that you're going to find bias in, in everything, right? In, in everything that we do. And it doesn't always have to rise to the, the four alarm fire. But I think having that conversation, whether it's with, you know, just attending this MCLE today is an important part of recognizing bias. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to be immediately able to change it. It doesn't mean that you're going to implement that company wide. But I think having the ability to recognize, hey, is there something else going on here? Um, you know, I think artificial intelligence is here to stay. I think that the the more automated things get, uh, the more that we will use it. But I think that there's an importance in in really looking at that underlying uh algorithm, that human factor, if we're trying to simulate human behavior, is that human behavior, for instance, in the Microsoft Tay case, is there something inherently racist that some sense comes out in that? Um, and it was, it was, it was people on Twitter really kind of creating this person, this, this bot. Um, but I think that when you start to look at how those little tiny uh, instances of bias over time build, then you start to see the massive effects that this can have. So I think when we're talking about managing bias rather than eliminating bias, um, I think we have to recognize it. We have to do something about it when we see it, but we also have to look at who's the decision maker on the bias, right? So if, who is, if somebody's going to say, this is bias that we act on and this is bias that we don't act on, then that gatekeeper needs to be somebody who understands and like a, a number two on this slide, um, just because that gatekeeper hasn't experienced the bias doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a valid bias that the, or incidence of bias that's being identified. So I think we really have to look at who, who those people are within our organizations who have that decision-making capability, like in the Liberty Chevrolet case, where you know, it was basically company-wide. All of these salespeople were told based on a bias that a certain group of people wouldn't read these things or a certain group of people wouldn't understand that. Um, nobody there stood up and said, hey, that, we probably shouldn't do that. that. That doesn't make sense to me. Or maybe there were even salespeople of that group that would say, this is kind of not cool. So I, I think it's going to be an ongoing struggle for us, uh, especially as AI gets involved, to continue to recognize the bias, and then determine what we do with it. Um, obviously, the end goal would be to eliminate it. Do I think that we're going to eliminate it? Not in my lifetime. No, I don't. Um, but managing it does, make, does, does appeal to me, for sure. And also, Diana, you brought up a very interesting point, the fact that with AI and the learning, the machine learning continuing to evolve, someone has to stand up and say something because the predictive model continues to repeat itself. And it does so in a circle based on what it deems to have been effective. And so if there is not an interruption in that cycle, it will continue to refine itself. And if it's not going in the right direction, it will continue to go in the wrong direction and quite possibly get worse. And we're looking at things with respect and we can't just gloss over them when we're seeing companies that are emerging and that have already emerged where they're dealing with individuals' liberty and they're dealing with individuals, you know, possibly being targeted wrongly for different things and different actions that could have tremendous impacts on their life. I mean, it's one thing to be arrested, accused of shoplifting. shoplifting. It's another thing to be arrested and being accused of being a potential terrorist and how they will treat the different individuals and what protocol law enforcement has to go to go through because of that characterization. So we encourage individuals before they use AI, especially if it's in decisions 
such as those or other areas to very carefully request a copy of the data, request a copy of the accountability, have they uh, examined it. For example, in San Francisco, they allow, they were discussing allowing facial recognition technology, but they have in their law where they're asking what checks and balances, how is the data analyzed, how is it examined, rather than blindly accepting it. Because when we're talking about facial recognition, you can be perceived on cameras that are already security cameras positioned up different places. So not just cameras in police cars, but cameras that are at fixed pole positions and other things like that, or at the airport and situations like that. So, you know, you have to be very cognizant of that. It appears that we have, I think, a new question. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to handle the, the first one that's on my screen, which is it's just an observation that speaking up in many organizations uh, can get somebody labeled as a troublemaker or even fired. And it's very true. Um, this is also connected to another uh, question here about whistleblower protection. So let's, uh, let's try to deal with both of those live. Um, uh, for the first one, uh, I think it's very true. Speaking up in, in many organizations, uh, especially if they don't have a, a, a program for diversity or for elimination of bias, uh, definitely can can get you labeled as that. I, I've experienced that myself personally. Um, so I think that what's important to do is to build consensus where you can to talk to others and see if their experience is the same as yours. It may be different. It may, be, you know, for instance, I, I come from a family of seven children. We all grew up in the same suburb of Los Angeles. Um, several of us believe that in elementary school and high school, we experienced racism. Some of my brothers believe that there was no racism whatsoever. So I think you will find that the individual's experience is going to vary, and it's not going to be the same for every person of a specific, you know, group within your organization. Um, I think one of the other things we talked about in the Q and A was, you know, is it is it a one time thing? Is it a series of events? Is it prevalent? Is it pervasive? Uh, and I think you need to evaluate it in that way. Um, sometimes speaking to people outside your organization can help you uh, learn a little bit more about whether or not it's something that you want to bring to management. Finding an ally in upper management always is uh, a good thing. Um, but I, 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 I don't have a specific answer for how not to get labeled a troublemaker. Um, I have been labeled that. Um, and as far as the other question about whistleblower protection for staffers, I think it depends on the organization, right? If you're, if you're in a, a, a federal position or you work for the state, there may very well be whistleblower protection. Um, you may not have that protection in a smaller privately owned company. Um, Don, do you have any thoughts on either of those issues? No, I, I agree with what you said. And I was actually looking down to the next question that was posed in which it says that uh, someone who is white who speaks up gets labeled as a troublemaker. So you are telling the white person to do a survey of minorities to see if it is a trend. I don't think the intent is to do a survey, more so we're trying to awaken individuals and in some form or fashion, make them be a little bit more um, cognizant of things that might go on around you that you might not have been paying attention to before. And now since we, and so the purpose of us giving such different examples, whether it was in housing, advertising, or credit, or uh, for credit cards, or purchasing of a vehicle, to let you know how some of these things can manifest itself into society. And then with the examples that Diana provided with respect to legal recruiting, we're talking about just opening our eyes as she gave that example of, let's say all of the attorneys are going out to lunch and are some attorneys being excluded. And do you see any type of patterns here as to why? Also, I know that there were different studies I heard years ago about Harvard. It was either Harvard or Stanford. They did a study to see how different uh, attorneys at, or associates at firms were treated that were non white in terms of how their work was reviewed, in terms of certain opportunities for different projects that came up, who they were given to. So I think that's more so the, the idea that we're getting at here. Did you want to add something to that, Diana? 
I'd like to add something to that. I, you know, I think that um, I'm not saying that a white person should do a survey of minorities to see if it's a trend. I do think that if if it's if it's being done in your presence and perhaps maybe a person of color is, is not there, for instance, if there's a group of people that you hear consist consistently denigrating another group of individuals, then you as a white person can be an ally to say, hey, you know what, I, I don't know that that's cool to say. Um, but I also am, am acutely aware of, of um, if there's a situation where a person who is in the majority tries to speak up for me without asking me uh, whether that's my experience, um, it may start it may start something that that the person of color, let's say, may not want. Um, so I think it's not about surveying them. I think it's about actually being friends with those people. If they work in your company, uh, I, I think you have to know the people that you work with and then opening that door for the conversation of, hey, you know, I heard this thing and I wondered if it bothered you. And really having a dialogue and getting to know what those trigger points might be. Because frankly, uh, you know, Don, you can speak to this as well. I think that there may be a higher threshold for those of us who've experienced discrimination on sometimes a daily basis, but definitely more often than other groups, where uh, sometimes you've gotten so used to saying, hey, that doesn't bother me, that it, it, I let things go sometimes. So, um, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. And again, we are talking about recognizing bias where it manifests itself, but I'm hoping that that gives a little bit more of a basis as far as not feeling impotent to raise these issues, not saying, hey, if I speak up, I'm just going to be blasted. But hey, if I speak up and I am building this consensus of people who know that I'm an ally and know that they can count on me, then we as a group can come forward and say, hey, you know what? That last presentation that used that example was really kind of offensive and we're wondering if there's another way that we can do it or can we be part of the committee that helps decide programming or something like that really trying to bring um a little bit more of, of a, a unified approach to those things so you hopefully know, that answers a little bit of that question that's a very interesting question also it, it made me think i recall at a time when i was in law school a professor located a case and it had a derogatory term in the case and when i had to read the case the night before class i was wondering why they would select that case because the case wasn't in the case book so the professor purposely went out and found a case that had it in, in the class no one felt comfortable whether they were white black or any other race with using the term and so since you have everyone read along portions of the case and no one would volunteer to read it or read it the professor read it so with respect and so after class i didn't like it i uh the night before i spoke with some older attorneys and asked them their opinion on it and after class i walked up to the professor and explained to him my position explained to him that i thought that was a little un, uh, unnecessary and i asked him why exactly it was used to get his point of view on it now with respect to what was posed to us was I in the minority? I was definitely in the minority because I was the only person that said something. However, for me, I could not just allow something that seemed so blatant where the whole class was uncomfortable to go unchecked. So sometimes a lot of progress and change that has come in society has come about with different individuals willing to take a stand and do so on their own and maybe being ostracized and then recognized later. So it's a personal decision but it's certain things that I am not content with. I'm not content with seeing anyone abused, regardless of race, sex, age. I don't like elder abuse. So I, you know, I may take a stand for something in that situation that might be unpopular just because of my personal preferences, I can't allow it. So again, it's a personal decision, but it's just something to think about in terms of how you want to handle and manage things. I think that that's, that may be our time. I hope that we were able to answer uh, the questions that you, you did pose in the chat. Um, John? Yeah, and I, we want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day to join us during this lunch hour. We hope that you find the materials that we've sent informative and helpful, and we wish you all the best. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thanks.